So we are really talking about a sequence of events here. In, we're assuming that Task 102 is available in your hands and you know what it is. And I think Eric will spend more time about explaining what it actually is, but I'll focus on Regorafnib because I will, uh, will kind of make a case for Regorafnib followed by Task 102. So what is Regorafnib? Regorafnib is a drug that you're probably familiar with, which uh, came out of the, which got approval in last line colorectal cancer based on the correct study, which Eric and I co-chaired. So Eric and actually will kind of discuss against his own trial. Um, two to one randomization, regorafnib versus placebo. All these patients had bevacizumab, cetuximab, if, ras, if k ras oxaplatin, renotec, and five of you, really refractory patient population. Hazard ratio 0.77 was actually recently, in terms of overall survival, until FIRE 3 came out, the strongest hazard ratio for overall survival we had seen, beating a flibacet, beating uh, uh, the TML, bevacizumab beyond progression study. This was the strongest hazard ratio, 23% reduction of, of death events. Now, we saw that not every patient benefited if you look at the progression-free survival curve in this last line patient population, and you get a scan at eight weeks here, you see that 50% of patients have progressive disease, but the rest 50% actually benefit, and the hazard ratio for progression-free survival, which is a real marker of the treatment effect of this drug in this last line setting, is 0.49, 51% reduction of progression rate. This is an active drug. It's an active drug in mainly inducing stable disease. It doesn't turn things around in terms of inducing responses, but there is a significant number of patients um, that actually benefit, almost 45% of patients benefit with stumor stabilization, which can actually last quite long. And all of us who have used regorafnib for, let's say, in, in, since, you know, in the last years, have patients where the treatment effect lasted for almost a year, because they are some of these patients who respond. PFS benefit was consistent across all subgroups. You have a slice and dice, a pre-treatment, RAS status, et cetera. Every single patient population that looked at benefited from this, uh, from this treatment. Now, this is not the only set of data. The CONCUR study was a, a kind of a subsequent study which included um, Asian patients outside of Japan, because that was the missing link in the world. Uh, similar design, regorafnib versus placebo, two to one randomization. The critical issue is that these patients did not have to have all biologic therapies before, based on the approval status of these drugs in their countries. A lot of patients, 40% of patients, did not receive biologics, bevacizumab, or EGF septa antibodies. So, what's the effect of this less pre treated patient population, primary endpoint overall survival, and a hazard ratio of 0.55? in colorectal cancer is really impressive. Less heavily pre-treated patient population, now you have a 45% reduction of death events. That is the strongest hazard ratio ever for overall survival we've seen in, in, since 5 of you was invented uh, in, in the 1950s. So when you now look at the subgroup analysis and coming back to the point of how heavily pre-treated are patients? How far down the line should they be? When do they still benefit from therapy? If you have no prior target therapy, your hazard ratio for survival goes down to 0.31. Now we're in the range of imatinib and gist. This is a very strong biologic effect. And if you look at the prior target therapy, very similar to what we've seen with the correct study, 0 0.78, 0 0.77, really similar. Now if you now, um, sensor for patients who had further, further lines of therapy after regorafnib to eliminate those patients to have no dilution of the effect of subsequent lines of therapy, you can see, again, higher, a very strong hazard ratio of 0 0.41. These curves spread out very nicely. So if you ever had a doubt that regorafnib is an effective agent, it is, it is an effective agent. Um, Progression-free survival, very similar shape of the curve, but the curve split a little bit higher here because less pre-treated patients, higher rate of benefit for these patients. We know about side effects, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because one of the things that a lot of uh, us experienced when we started using regorafnib, we realized patients have side effects early on, especially if we use the higher dose, the package insert dose, right up front. If we don't monitor patients very closely, 
after seven to, eight to, to 14 days, so once a week for the first cycle, we can run into problems, but especially with hand, foot, skin reaction and fatigue. But we have learned that over time, when patients stay on therapy and you manage their to toxicities proactively, the incidence and the severity of these side effects actually attenuate over time. So the first cycle is the cycle that you need to keep patients through and need to monitor these patients. After that, longer term, these patients actually tolerate the treatment much better. So that is our goal of proactively managing these patients. Now, we are dealing with the idea of, you know, how to optimize dosing and schedule, et cetera. So this is not lost on the investigators. And we are actually running a study, or it's just opened, looking at an escalating dosing schedule versus de-escalating dosing schedule of regorafenib, looking at the idea that if the side effects come more prominently in the first cycle, why not use the first three weeks to go from 80 milligrams to 120 milligrams to 160 milligrams in a stepwise manner to bridge the time when patients have most side effects. This is what I use in my clinical practice. And if you haven't tried it, try it. It works in a, in a lot of patients. Um, and not every patient will go to 160, but it's easier on patients if you escalate than if you start with the highest dose. Now, interestingly, the CONCUR study had a very nice quality of life analysis. And you can see that over time, this is here the different cycles, patients actually, the quality of life index is virtually identical. But what I really like here is the number of patients who were able to fill out the questionnaires. And you can see here, two to one randomization, two cycles, 124 and 53 patients. And then all of a sudden, there's hardly a patient who can fill out the, the questionnaire in the placebo arm because patients who are dead cannot fill out a questionnaire. And so this is another parameter that regorafenib actually works. And it comes down to how many patients are actually alive to really report their quality of life. You know, so regorafenib is an agent that works. Now, what do you do after regorafenib? So if you use regorafenib earlier, can you do uh, treatment after regorafenib, like TAS-102 or other things? Yes, you can. We have a joint analysis of Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, and USC, looking at you know, what happens when patients get treated with regorafenib and what is happening afterwards. So post-regorafenib therapy in about 37% of patients, standard therapy, clinical trial, interesting clinical trial, had very little activity in this setting. Also depends on the availability of what kind of clinical trial you have. If you have standard therapy, they're actually patients who get re-challenged with the treatment they had previously progressed on that have a response. So there is life, there is treatment after regorafenib. This is not your dead end, this is not your last stop. So you can use regorafenib to follow something else. Now, uh, Dr. Van Kutzen will highlight the TAS-102 data, the RECOR study, which was really exactly cloned in its protocol from the correct study. We probably only switch regorafenib and TAS-102 out uh, with a word processor. Two to one randomization, simple, uh, same sample size, very similar inclusion criteria, and even regorafenib was allowed as, as prior therapy. Survival here, impressive, no doubt, 0.68. Not as impressive as the CONCUR data with um, 0.55, but in the similar range, somewhere between CONCUR and CORRECT. Um, Progression-free survival, you see exactly the same shape of the curve as regorafenib, exactly the same shape. And we can do a PowerPoint experiment I take these things away and I can show you these superimposed correct data, the regorafenib data. This is what it is. It's remarkable. It is completely superimposable. And that tells you this is a patient phenomenon. It's not necessarily a drug phenomenon, it's a patient phenomenon. Now, TAS has less subjective toxicity for patients. No doubt about that. There's no hand foot syndrome. There's leukopenia, neutropenia, which is min, mainly asymptomatic. In these patients, uh, uh, this is just a lab effect, very little um, diarrhea or uh, neutropenic fever. Question is, when do you best use these agents? When do you, what's the best sequence of agents? Comparison here, you can see it's great to have treatment options, regorafenib and TAS-102 here. They're active agents. CONCUR shows the less heavily pretreated patients are. When you, when you don't let them deteriorate their performance status too much, they might have better benefit. And that is very important. 
you want these patients to get both agents, regorafenib and TAS-102, but if you use TAS-102 first and then regorafenib, patients might deteriorate with their performance status so that they might not be able to benefit. They will be not able to really be, uh, have stable disease on regorafenib. Now, so why regorafenib first? All active agents, as I said, we need both. It prov regorafenib provides more benefit in less pretreated patients. Don't use it in PS2 patients or higher. This is where patients, you, you really only inflict side effects, very little efficacy. And don't let them deteriorate to that point by using too many lines of therapy before, including TAS-102 or re-challenging with false fox and whatever you might want to do, because if they go further down the line, they will not be able to benefit from regorafenib. And we saw that cytotoxic therapy, we have data on that, is active after regorafenib. So it's a clear message. Very important message, regorafenib followed by TAS-102 is preferred. Thank you very much.